As we near the end of another school year, administrators and teachers say they're concerned about ongoing problems with student behavior, conduct that can be more disruptive than before the pandemic started. In a moment, Amna Nawaz will have a conversation she recorded earlier about state proposals to deal with that. But let's start with what we heard from teachers across the country. My name is Joanna Rosado, and I'm a high school alternative education teacher. I used to say I used to worry about just a few kids. Now there's the opposite. It's probably just a few kids that I'm not worried about. I'm Krista Nigro, and I'm a kindergarten teacher in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm seeing things like, you know, students that are attacking other students or they're throwing furniture at other students. Um, in one instance, I had a student uh, open up a pair of uh, scissors that she took off my desk and threw them at my face. My name is Dr. Precious Simonetz, and I am a proud creative writing teacher at Miami New Orleans Senior High School. Many students are overwhelmed. They are going through a lot of different things. And unfortunately, many schools are not built to address those things. My name is Jen Heater, and I am the English department chairperson and senior English teacher for Bremen High School in Bremen, Indiana. So what we've seen here at Bremen High School, and I believe around the country, is a, an extreme uptick in mental health issues with our students. We're seeing that many students are more fearful, more wary of putting themselves out there, more anxious in general. Um, and that anxiety can present itself in a number of different ways. It can look like unchecked anger. It can look like isolation. The last couple of years have been very interesting. Uh, we've definitely seen a spike in behaviors. Um, it could be anywhere from, you know, hitting, biting, spitting, uh, throwing furniture. And so at times it's a little unsafe in the classroom. Many students um, may not be willing to dig a little deeper and kind of explore what they may be feeling, right? So it, it is easier to do something in the classroom to get kicked out, right? That way I'm getting what I want. I don't have to deal with that teacher. I don't have to deal with what, what I'm working through. So let me get kicked out. Let me, let me, let me leave this piece, right? Um, but I do feel like the better option would, would be to get them to stay. What we're not equipped to do is to identify students' needs when they have mental health issues, such as anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, and other things that normally do hit in the high school and middle school ages. It's, it's a shame because we're there to educate the future of America. That's what we want to do. And we're having a really hard time doing it with the behaviors that are presenting themselves. I would suggest that our legislators um, respond to this by putting more money into training teachers. And I would ask the question, are we responsible for our students' mental health? If so, and if we're the ones who need to respond to it, then we need to be trained adequately to respond well, because a lot is hanging in the balance here. In response to concerns about students' behavioral issues, including some violence, a number of states are now moving to change their laws, putting forward bills that empower teachers with greater disciplinary powers. That has raised more questions and concerns about the impact on students. Talia Gonzalez tracks all of this closely. She's a professor at the UC College of the Law in San Francisco. She joins me now. Professor Gonzalez, welcome and thanks for joining us. As you've been tracking, lawmakers in a number of states are, are now moving forward, proposing bills that make it easier to discipline students, remove students, including harsher penalties for younger kids. Before we get into the details of some of those bills, why are we seeing so many of those bills right now? What's the argument behind them? I think the argument is exactly what you're hearing from the teachers, right, which is about safety. The problem is, is that the argument isn't matching safety with healthy school communities. Um, and we, you know, we have spent so much time moving past punishment um, and really thinking about what is in the best interest of educating our children. And we've forgotten in this moment, in this post-COVID reality, or if you can call it that, where our young people and our teachers are sitting at the front lines in these places of tension, that we actually have to promote and build those positive school climates. So it's much easier to go for the tool that was in existence before and say, just get out, right? We heard that as well, right? Um, before from teachers saying, it's much easier to just leave the classroom. So it's all of that, right? It's the unwillingness to put money. It's uh, an, a very short-term measure, and it's not thinking about how we're actually building safe 
and healthy schools. Let me give a few specific examples here so folks know mm -hmm. what we're talking about. Um, in Arizona, for example, there's a bill that would lower the age students can be suspended to five, so that now includes kindergartners. In Florida, teachers would have more authority to remove students who they deem disobedient or disrespectful. In Nebraska, teachers would be allowed to to use force in the classroom to physically restrain students who they deem disruptive. On the spectrum of responses, are there disciplinary powers you think teachers should have and those they shouldn't? Absolutely. Teachers need to be able to have safe and healthy classrooms, right? And I keep using those words together because those actually are the essential components of what we're talking about. But what teachers shouldn't be um, forced to do is to make these discretionary decisions in the moment that says, you're disobedient you're, or you're disrespectful or you engaged in disorderly conduct because so often those are coded for other types of behaviors, right? So the North Carolina law, for example, that also exists includes inappropriate language and dress code violations. Dress code violations and inappropriate language aren't the things that aren't keeping our schools safe or aren't making teachers feel like they can't teach students and children feeling like they can't be engaged in learning. So it's about a continuum of support. Right? How are we thinking about multi-tiered interventions? What is it to turn to the evidence and say, where does positive behavioral interventions exist? Where do restorative practices exist? How do we put into practice what we know works um, to ensure that the social, the emotional, and the academic learning is happening? What about the potential impact on students here? I mean, we know, given history and studies, that <sighs> black and brown students disproportionately face disciplinary measures when uh, they're in school. What are you worried about the impact mm -hmm. of this could be? I'm just worried that the data's already been so disturbing. Um, we know that non-white students, and particularly black children, are disciplined more severely across every category. You know, just this year, Scientific American released a study that half of the 250 kids expelled expelled from preschool, younger than age five, were black boys, right? And that nationally, preschool children are suspended more than once, and who are those children? Those are black kids. Um, and so we just have, a, have to have a real clarity that these offenses and the ways at which we're then pushing young people out of their schools lead to a whole set of lifelong consequences. So it's not just, oh, the disparities exist, the discipline gap exists, and ultimately a student decides to not come to school stop engaging in the classroom. You know, the risk factor of missing 15 days of school for a suspension means you are seven times more likely to drop out, but that that means that you will have less access to jobs, housing, participating in society voting, and even your life expectancy. And then of course, I think there's so much evidence about entry into the juvenile adult systems. Um, you know, Rice University's Education Research Consortium just released data that for every suspension a student faced, they're seven and a half percent more likely to have contact with the juvenile justice system. And who those young people are, are our Black students, our Latinx students, and our Native and Indigenous students as well. But I also want to bring attention to the fact that it's not just in the context of race or in the context of gender, but students who um, are also experiencing learning disabilities, right, mm -hmm. are Historical data, our current data shows us across all categories of discipline, suspensions, expulsions, referrals to law enforcement, it is um, students with disabilities who can lose as much as three times of as much instructional time from discipline, um, and that that's most acute for our black students in particular. Professor Gonzalez, dare I ask, what's the answer here? I mean, teachers yeah. need a way to be able to control yes. and keep safe classrooms. We know students have behavioral issues after what they've endured the last few mm -hmm. years. Budgets are finite. What can people do? We look to exactly what we've been doing so far, right? There's been incredible investments over the last decade in what our whole child um, and multi-tiered systems of support. That's the academic, that's the behavioral, and that's the social and emotional, right? That's the evidence-based, trauma-informed, high-quality core curriculum. So what does that mean? Positive behavioral interventions have long-standing records um, of having positive outcomes. Social emotional learning, all in legislation as well. Restorative justice, all in legislation. So instead of the laws that we're talking about, we should be scaffolding up those and then also coupling those with investments in mental health services. Because when you have multi-tiered system interventions, you flip the script. You increase graduation rates, right? You increase academic achievement, you increase test scores, you increase grade completion, you engage students, they're less truant, they're coming to school, and you have positive climates. And that's when children thrive and that's when they can learn. 
All right, that is Talia Gonzalez, professor at the UC College of the Law in San Francisco, joining us tonight. Professor, thank you. Thank you so much, I appreciate it.